Okay. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me to present uh, José Pinto Arte. Uh, José Pinto Arte is a, a, a well-known uh, um, researcher on uh, computational methods uh, uh, in architecture and uh, urbanism. Uh, he's got a PhD degree from MIT in 2001 um, based on... Uh, sorry? Okay. And uh, the, on the topic of uh, um, housing uh, customization. Uh, and uh, after that, he continued working on uh, uh, formal methods in, uh, in both architecture and, and urbanism. Uh, he's presently uh, uh, the, the director of the uh, uh, Stuckman Research Center in um, uh, Penn State University and uh, where he's continuing to do uh, his research uh, and on, on, on these topics. Um, so it's a, it's a pleasure. I'll give the floor to him because I think he has a very interesting presentation uh, uh, to make. And um, he also have, has several uh, uh, works on, on, on these topics you can easily find. Uh, um, uh, many references on the internet about his work. Okay, José. Okay, I I'd like someone to confirm that you can hear me well so that I can start the presentation. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you, uh, José, for uh, the introduction. Thank you, the organization, for this very kind invitation. Since we are a little bit over time, I will try to cut my presentation shorter. Uh, so that uh, we contribute to, you know, um, get us into uh, back in time. So uh, my presentation has two parts. The the first part uh, is about uh, static optimization, and the second part about dynamic optimization. So the title is from concrete printing to responsive uh, facades. So talking about the first part. On the 3D printing of houses, this is you know where I teach now, the Stuckman School at, at Penn State University, and this is the the team of people that work in, with me at the Additive Construction Laboratory, so that develop the research on uh, concrete printing, and this is our installations uh, where we do our printing experiments and also our testing experiments. So you basically do two things: you print and then you test the the printing parts. So talking about the context that led uh, to the development of this uh, research. So our mission, the mission of the lab, is to support the integration of digital technologies in design and construction and contribute for the achievement of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. However, the focus is not on technology, but on the strategic deployment of technology to address contemporary societal issues. So the graph is a graph that I always like to show in my presentations because it's uh, the main motivation for the research. By looking at the graph that shows the growth of human population, you will see that we'll need to build over the next 20 years as many houses as you have built in the, past, uh, in the past 2000 years. So it's a huge scale of the problem and we need to develop innovative design and construction technology and technologies to be able to tackle uh, this um, problem. So this slide shows a little bit more about the context. Uh, on the upper side, on the left hand side, you will see what we call an informal settlement where people, uh, you know, when people build their own houses because they cannot afford to build a house uh, on the market. So it's a very customized solution, but it has many problems. It does not have uh, public uh, infrastructure. It does not have public spaces. However, it's a very rich environment from the spatial and the uh, uh, formal uh, viewpoint. On the right hand side, you see what's the traditional governmental approach, which has also some problems. It's very uniform. It does not have public spaces as well. And, uh, it, you know, it, it's very monotonous, very uh, boring. So what we are trying to do is to develop design methodologies that will allow us to generate new environments that have some of the qualities that we value in traditional historical settlements, like the one you see 
uh, on the left hand side at the bottom of the slide. So all these images are from um, Brazil, you know, a formal settlement, formal uh, massified approach to the design of housing and an historical settlement. Just uh, to give you an idea of the kind of approach that we are advocating. So if you think uh, of the DNA chain in nature, so it's a code that allows you uh, to manipulate and generate different creatures but in a way that each creature is the, the most adapted to the environment uh, where they live. So that's, this is the idea that you want to bring in into architecture and urban planning. So we came up with uh, this idea of a conceptual um, uh, framework that includes a design system that can uh, read the context and generate uh, uh, customized design solutions and the production system that is able to very quickly uh, materialize the solutions output by the design system. So what's uh, new or not so new at this point in time uh, is the use of computers to control both the design system and the production system. Talking a little bit about the design system. So the idea is that you have rule based uh, design uh, for housing and that you can couple these with um, interfaces that are friendly so that people can generate their own design. So you basically have two levels. On the first level, you have a set of rules that are generated by the designers, and those rules can then later be used by the end users, by the future inhabitants of the house to generate a customized uh, solution. So this works both at the housing level and at the urban level. So once you have the ability to generate uh, different candidate solutions, you need to find a way uh, to uh, rate and rank those solutions from different viewpoints, like for instance, from the viewpoint of energy consumption. So you basically use AI to guide the generation of solutions towards solutions with very specific desirable uh, goals. Uh, the next step is the production system. So the production systems allows you to very quickly in an expedite way to materialize the solutions output by the design system. There are different possibilities. At the moment, we are exploring what we call additive construction, which is the use of uh, additive manufacturing at the construction scale. Uh, like you see on the right hand side, the printing of a part at our lab. This is actually the capital of a classical uh, column uh, or a very large classical column printed uh, in the lab. So the idea is that you use this technology to very quickly uh, produce the houses output by the design system. So talking about the research uh, to enable uh, this idea. So the pr printing is actually a very complex system with many different variables linked to the environment, like temperature, humidity, pressure, and so on, to the material properties uh, like viscosity, flowability, buildability, and so on, but also the, pr the printing features, the, 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 the variables associated with the printing system, like, you know, the extrusion speed, like the robotic arm speed, and, and you know, so many other variables. And then you have the variables associated uh, with um, the design, uh, like, you know, the tool pass design, uh, the, the width and length of the, of the filaments, you know, there are specific patterns, and then you have variables associated uh, with the building, the design of the building. So what we are trying to do is to create a mathematical model relating all these variables. So you can have a very, uh, you know, control, a very high control of the printing process to achieve shape accuracy and guarantee structural uh, stability. So what we need to do, we need to develop uh, mixtures that are extrudable. Uh, we have been focused on two types of materials. So, so cementitious, cementitious materials, which are mixtures that have Portland uh, uh, based cement as the main binder. But you're also looking at geopolymers that use other natural materials in, in some cases, recycled materials uh, to produce the binder and also clay based mixtures. So the challenge in this case is to develop a material that flows well while it's being extruded but then after being extruded, it should hold its shape uh, so that it does not deform beyond a certain point. So that, that's a challenge. So there's a, a time frame, there's a window in which uh, this can actually uh, happen. Then we need to develop the printing system. So this slide shows the evolution of our printing system from a very small scale uh, printing machine 
to the machine that we have today, today that we'll see later in some of other slides. Uh, so you, you need to develop the system in a way that you guarantee, uh, you know, an appropriate printing envelope. It should not be too small so you can print buildings. It should, be, should not be too large. Otherwise, it makes it very difficult to deploy uh, the printing system. So in other words, you want a system that's easy to transport uh, and deploy on site, move around the site, so that you don't spend too much time setting up and, and setting up the printing system. Then you need to understand how the material behaves after being extruded. So what happens is because concrete takes time uh, to set, uh, takes time uh, to harden, uh, it deforms uh, under the weight of the subsequent layers uh, until it hardens enough to hold the shape. So in other words, if you want to print a cylinder, uh, and if you design and print a cylinder, it's going to deform and you will end up with a, a cone, a truncated cone, or it actually might collapse. So what you need to do is to compensate for this deformation. So you do geometric compensation. So if you want to print a cylinder, you will actually deform the cylinder until it becomes an inverted cone. Uh, and once uh, that happens, uh, you print and it will acquire the desired uh, shape. So you need to do uh, the, the need to develop these kind of algorithms to control the quality of the printing process in terms of shape accuracy, but also structural stability. So at the same time, you need to understand how the material behaves structurally uh, during the printing process. So you might be aware of software that we have today to check for the structural performance of concrete structures in the hardened state after they set. So we had no software to actually uh, check for the structural performance of concrete in the fresh state while being extruded. And that's exactly the type of software that we are uh, developing. So this software allows you to predict whether a shape is printable, whether the material acquires enough, enough strength during the printing process to remain uh, in place. So as you can see in this slide on the left hand side, we designed uh, a part that the software predict it would collapse. And you'll see an image that it actually collapsed in the way it was uh, you know, um, predicted by the software. On the right hand side, you see a shape that the software predicted that it would not collapse. And in fact, it did not collapse. So this software is used uh, as a tool for designers to design buildings for printing. Then we work with what we call Functionally, functionally graded materials. So as you know, any type of concrete includes a binder, which is the glue and the aggregates. So the binder holds together the aggregates. In functionally graded materials, you replace part of the traditional aggregates like you know gravel or sand by other type of aggregates with very specific properties, like for instance, cork granules or expanded clay granules and so on. So why to do this? So imagine a wall, and uh, if you do the structural analysis of the wall, you will see that the, the structural requirements on the wall are not the same in all the points. So the loads are distributed along the wall in a certain way. So the idea here is that you make a material that is stronger where it needs to be stronger and it's lighter uh, when it can be lighter. So in this way, you can actually, if you use cork frames, you will improve the thermal performance of the wall. So our work shows that if you follow this strategy, you will be able to save up to 27% in energy consumption by optimizing the performance of building parts. So uh, you see here a small wall section being uh, printed following this strategy. So the part that you see on the uh, right hand side as a height part on what would be the external uh, pane of the wall to protect the inside from the external weather conditions. Then uh, the other aspect is actually to find out how you can print the entire structure from the uh, foundation, the wall, and also the roof. So we are learning from historical examples, namely vaults and domes, to understand how, how they can be printed without formwork. Why not using formwork? because formwork accounts for 60% of the construction costs in concrete structures. So if you are able to print structures in concrete without formwork, 
we are making construction simpler and saving money and actually, you know, making it more sustainable because you know, are, you know, uh, using uh, woods that would uh, be wasted after the printing process, after the construction process is uh, finished. So, um, because the process is very complex and many things can occur during the printing process, for instance, if you have been printing for some time, the concrete inside the machine tends uh, to set a little bit. And because it, it gets more viscous, it will slow down uh, the extrusion. And that, you know, and that will affect the printing process. For instance, you are because of the you are decreasing the extrusion rate, but keeping the robotic arm, the filaments will get thinner. And at some point they might not overlap and making thereby making the structure weaker. So you need to monitor the printing process. Usually we have been doing this, uh, you know, manually. So by you know looking at the uh, at the printing process and uh, you know detecting when something is is wrong and correcting in real time. But what we are developing now is actually the technology to monitor automatically the printing process by installing sensors, like for instance three D scanning technology or humidity sensors. Uh, you know, so in in other words, sensors that that can monitor and detect when something goes wrong. And then you use the algorithms to correct in real time the printing process. For instance, by increasing uh, the extrusion speed uh, to compensate for the slowdown of the process due to the material ha having become more viscous. Then uh, we are also uh, conducting a test to guarantee uh, the, the required strength of the printing concrete. So we basically need to comply with the existing building co code, so we need to make sure that printed concrete achieves the strength that is required by the existing regulations, compressive strength, but also flexural uh, strength. And then uh, we are also concerned with designing uh, structures that can be completely sealed, and the reason for doing this uh, is the following. So if you want to print houses on another planet like the moon, or um, the Mars, where there is no atmosphere, you need to pressurize the interior to guarantee, you know, um, conditions compatible with the human life. So, in other words, uh, the structure should not have any kind of leaks. So, we are developing strategies to avoid joints, uh, well, because joints are, are a source of problems. You know, uh, in construction on Earth, they can be a source of. Uh, construction pathologies where you have leaks of water and air that might damage the construction over time. At the same time, we are developing strategies to place uh, window frames and other technical installations uh, while uh, it being, you know, you are printing the building to completely automate uh, the printing process. And uh, you are conducting durability uh, tests to check for the durability of the material, for instance, through a series of freeze thaw cycles that you have in a place like the moon or Mars or you know in the uh, places on Earth with harsh conditions, as I will talk about um, later. So you want to make sure that the material will be able to sustain these variations in temperature. And because you want to build buildings with more complex shapes and, and larger buildings, you also need to find ways to introduce reinforcement during the printing process. So these are different streams of research that we are uh, concerned uh, with. Uh, and because we are architects and we uh, care about the aesthetic uh, quality of what we do, we are also looking into how you can actually use printing to create uh, textures or play with colors so that they are concrete uh, with different colors. So in this image, you see uh, different experiments uh, done to understand which shapes can be printed. So in our quest for printing the entire building, including the roof, we need to understand how ca we can print inclined structures. So the maximum uh, printing angle is very important, you know, the inclination of the structure. So you see, you know, all these shapes like, you know, this one on the left hand side and these two are actually hollow shapes. So these were some experiments that we conducted to understand what's the maximum printing angle. At the same time, we are developing research to decrease these angles so that you can actually have more shallow uh, roof structures. Um, 
you know, thanks to the development of this research and the algorithms, we have been able to achieve a high breeding quality like you see, uh, like you see in this video. You know, it's printing a cylinder. It's very regular. And this, you know, was possible because we were using the algorithms that I've just mentioned. We can also see in this video the printing of an inclined wall uh, as a base for a roof uh, structure. And you also see, you know, how we are playing with the textures to create an aesthetically pleasing uh, surface for um, the building. So, um, we participated in the NASA's 3D printed Mars Habitat Challenge uh, to develop the technology. It was uh, due to our participation in this competition that we were able to raise the funding that was required to set up the lab. We were lucky enough to be uh, successful to uh, you know, earn several awards uh, during the challenge and uh, you know, we and develop the research at the same time. So basically, the challenge had two streams. Uh, one was to design a house for Mars. The other one was to design a house to be printed on Earth. So what we do was to develop a platform, a beam based platform that basically with four components, a generative system, basically using parametric uh, design to generate, uh, you know, candidate solutions based on a Mr. set of rules. Please we call passengers and of the cabin number three zero one and three two three zero. Sorry for this interruption. Three two one, please. And it also has, uh, you know, another module that checks for the performance of the design being generated, like the structural performance, like the environmental performance, or also the constructability. And then you use optimization to find the solution uh, with the best performance from different viewpoints. And finally, the fourth module is to do the structural uh, simulation. For, uh, so the construction simulation is a 4, 4D construction simulation to see how the construction will evolve over time to guarantee, for instance, that the robots will not collide, so different robots will not collide during the construction uh, process. So um, this is the output of the platform uh, for these two streams. One was the virtual construction level, you know, designing for Mars, that you see on the left hand side. And on the right hand side, it's the design that was output by the system to be printed on Earth. So they they are similar, but actually they are uh, different, right? So they have different uh, set of variable um, values. So this is um, the video that we used uh, to qualify for the finals of uh, the competition. Uh, so basically, we had to simulate the uh, printing process uh, to convince the organization that we would be able to successfully print uh, the structure. So we have a limited space uh, to place all the components of the printing system, like the silos where you kept the material, the silo for the water, the extruder, the robotic arms, and obviously the trucks um, you know, to um, move uh, the printing system uh, to the site. And at, at the same time, it was printing, you know, simulating the printing process, you know, you see a robot here printing, uh, you know, the structure. And at some point, there is the, the other robot will place uh, the window frames and, and then the, the printing will resume, um, as you will see um, in a minute. So one of the biggest challenges was to guarantee that we will be able, uh, that we would be able to place the window frames during printing uh, to, con to have a completely autonomous uh, construction uh, process. As you see, the, the last uh, window frame being printed. So this was not printed at full scale. This was printed at one third um, scale. This is an image of the actual uh, setup. While, uh, you know, when printing was, was almost finished, as you can see, it's very similar to what uh, we had uh, simulated. And thanks uh, to the use of this technology, we, we were able to print uh, in place the first uh, fully uh, uh, structure, including uh, you know, the foundation, the walls, and the roofing system. 
I have some videos. I will not show the videos, just you know, not to take so so much time. I, I can sh uh, show them at the end if we still have time. So what we are focusing now is actually printing on houses, uh, printing houses on Earth. So we have designed a housing system uh, for expandable houses. So you can you know customize the design house according to the uh, family uh, requirements. This house is to be printed near the university in the state of Pennsylvania in the US. And you see some images of the house. So we designed the house not to be different, not to stand out, but to blend in so that people will be more receptive to the idea of having a 3D printed house. So this is an example of a house with three bedrooms. And this is an example of a house with just one bedroom. So the house is basically expandable. So the other work that we are developing at the same time is designing houses for the Alaska permafrost regions. So the main difficulty in designing for these areas is that in the summer, the soil melts and you need to make sure that the structure will remain stable, that will not tilt and collapse in the summer. So that the, the design and printing of the foundation is the critical issue. Uh, so you can see some images of the site where we will um, uh, print hopefully um, next summer. So to design the house, we got inspiration from traditional architecture, but there are some examples of contemporary um, architecture. Namely, uh, you know, the Gothic architecture, the cross uh, vaults, uh, to be able to print uh, the, the roof um, uh, system, like you see in this example, uh, not actually far away from uh, my current um, location. So the idea is that you print uh, a module that has a shape of a cross vault, and you make uh, different houses by printing different modules. So you can actually customize the design of houses by producing uh, different modules. You see at the top an evolution of the printing process. You place, you know, uh, the piles the, which will be the main structure, and then you print on the top of the piles. Uh, to uh, to elevate the structure, to raise the structure. Why? Because you need uh, the house not to be uh, on the ground, because if the house is on the ground, the heat generated inside will tend to melt the soil even in the winter, so and the structure could become uh, unstable. Uh, we are also developing an expeditionary version of our printing system that would be easy to transport and deploy on this uh, remote uh, site. This is an image showing how the you know the one uh, module house would look like uh, in place. So in conclusion, uh, talking about the, the first part, so we have the techno technological means to provide everyone with a, a decent home. The technology technology used to colonize other planets can be used to solve the housing shortage problem on Earth. So the opportunities of additive manufacturing or additive construction for industry are tremendous. So let's take a look uh, at some of the advantages. So basically what you have, you have a beam based platform informed by artificial intelligence to optimize the design of the process and the products. So this will transform uh, the construction industry. So going from features to benefits. So we have mass customization as a possible feature of this approach, mass customization will translate into higher user satisfaction. But you also have an autom automated process. So the use of automation will means that we'll need less uh, labor. We have less labor requirements. So this will increase safety because we'll have less people uh, on, on the site. And as you know, the construction industry is a source of uh, problems or uh, many uh, you know accidents during work. So increasing safety is actually very important. Then you have a lower construction time uh, and they have a lower construction cost. And then because you are using functionally graded materials, you have less trade. So if you think of a wall, a wall is actually a very complex system, a traditional wall. We have the structure of the wall, you have the insulation, you have the water barrier, you have the finishing on the inside, you have the finishing on the outside. So there are many different trades involved. So if you find a way to simplify the construction, you'll actually be able to decrease the, uh, the cost. So less trades, simplified construction, a lower construction cost, but also lower construction time. And because there are, again, less people on site, increased safety. Because uh, you have fewer joints, 
uh, you have fewer construction pathologies and thereby lower maintenance uh, costs. And because you can optimize the design of the structure from, uh, from the environmental uh, uh, viewpoint, it means that you'll have uh, energy savings. So you have a lower operation cost as well. And, uh, and, and also a lower ecological footprint because you are consuming less energy. And then because you optimize the structural performance, uh, you means that you can uh, save materials. So remember, you are, you are not using formwork. You are using a lighter structure and then you can you know, have a lower ecological footprint because you are using less materials. It means a lower construction cost. And then because you are not using formwork, you can actually increase the complexity of uh, the shapes that you can uh, produce. So you have more material savings at the same time. Uh, and lower uh, uh, construction time and increase uh, safety. Um, and then you have increased design freedom, and this is very important. So if you th if you think of the first cars that were designed, they more or less resembled uh, carriages pulled by horses. So we are more or less at that stage. So the buildings that we are designing still remember the buildings that we built with the, uh, you know a different technology. But in the future, the, uh, thanks to the use of this technology, we can transform the language of architecture, you'll be able to uh, produce new forms. And because the idea is to use local local materials, so we go to a site, we use local materials to produce a, a type of concrete. It means that we have less transportation costs, which means decreased uh, CO2 uh, emissions and thereby you know, a lower ecological footprint again. So uh, to conclude this part of the presentation, in, with additive construction, construction, we can build safer, and faster, houses that are customized, more affordable, high performance, and aesthetically pleasing, while having a lower in environmental impact. So this concludes my presentation about static optimization. Why do I call it static optimization? Because you are optimizing the design and uh, for a certain site, and once you build the house, it will remain static. The house will not change. In dynamic optimization, it will change even after the house is built. So let's talk about um, you know dynamic optimization now. So let me change uh, the presentation and go to a dynamic presentation, dynamic optimization. So um, the example that I will show about dynamic optimization uh, it, it concerns the design of responsive uh, facades. Talking about the context, so buildings account for 40% of total energy consumption uh, in the US alone. So in the building envelopes are lar lar largely for the environmental performance. So through the use of kinetic, kinetic shading systems, you can improve the energy performance of buildings. So, however, you know, if you look at the examples that exist today of uh, buildings that, you know, that have a, a dynamic uh, envelope, they use mechanical systems, like this example of the Institut de Monde Arabe in Paris, uh, where you know, um, they use a mechanical system. But mechanical systems are very expensive and very hard to maintain. So they tend to get out of order after a certain time. So what we are doing is actually use smart materials to avoid mechanical systems. So the idea is that you use materials that can change their shape so that you avoid the use of mechanical systems. So we have been playing with two different kinds of materials. By stable systems, so basically, you know, by stable systems of structures are shapes that have to stable positions like you see in this uh, animation. Um, so you basically what you need to do, you need to move from one stable uh, position to the other one. So you don't need a lot of energy. You just need a small input of energy to make this uh, the system transition from one shape to the other. And then we're also using smart materials to activate the bistable materials. So let's talk about the method. So we are following two approaches. One is a bottom-up approach where you design the modules 
of the uh, facade shading system and they have a top-down approach that you follow to check for the performance to see to verify the impacts of using the this shading system this dynamic shading system on the energy performance of the building so a bottom-up approach and a top-down approach so uh you see in this example you know how we reproduce the the modules of the facade shading system uh you know there are lots of variables that have an influence on uh, on the you know on the performance of what we call these uh, flaps so in other words this is also a very complex system like you know uh, the concrete printing and you need to create a mathematical model relating all the variables so that we can actually use this model as a support of the design process. So talking about the bottom up part. So basically what we need to do is to be able to predict the performance of the physical elements. So we are using uh, you know, a finite element analysis to predict how the flaps will deform uh, while, uh, while uh, after they are produced. So this is very important because the, your ideas want to have a system that you change the shape. You want to be able to predict how the material or the, that shape will perform in transition from one stable state to another stable state. So you see in this example, uh, you know the system transition from one uh, uh, position to the other position. So what's critical here is the design, the shape of these elements. You know how, how large they are, the proportion, uh, and and see how much they can deflect. Because if you want to use this for creating a facade shading, you want to make sure there's significant difference between the open and closed part. So uh, you have to design uh, flaps with different shapes, with different proportions, with different material compositions to be able to find the one that's more suitable to the current um, problem. So what you need to do is to actually check for the environment performance. So basically you simulate the facade shading system and you use uh, you know, um, energy performance and lighting performance software to verify what's the impact of the different configurations on the, you know, on the environment inside the room. And you want to make sure that you design something that has the desirable environmental performance so though you see here examples of uh, this is you know shading system you're dealing with light you want to make sure that the, you have the right lighting levels at the right spots inside uh, the room so you and to make this possible you are you we are using two fibers to make the flaps uh, or the skin and using smart materials for the actuation so let's see how these work together. So you have here on the uh, on the left hand sides the flaps, and you also need to develop a way to actuate uh, these flaps. You may basically to make them transition from one state to the other. So we have manual actuation. But ideally, you should have automatic actuation so that the system changes its configuration over time, during the day and during the year. So there are two types of uh, automated actuations. One is to use magnets to you know, make the system transition from uh, um, you know, different, um, the two different states. And the other one is to use shape things that have shape memory. So you just need a small energy input, electrical input, to make the shape change its configuration and and if the, the shape memory alloys, because I, I, I don't know, I didn't want to take too much time for uh, this presentation. So this is, you know, how the system was designed, and this is still an evolving uh, process, because one important aspect is to decrease the visual weight of the system, because if you make the system visually too heavy, you know, it will defeat the purpose, because it will cast shadow on itself. And you see, you know, all the all the springs shape their shape, and all the the springs by playing with the springs, uh, you make the uh, the flaps transition from one position to the other, like we see uh, in this video. So, the shape 
uh, the, the the spring changed its position and it made uh, it change uh, its uh, the flap change its uh, state. So um, a critical issue is actually to design the flaps and the actuation mechanism. Uh, so there's a, a relationship between the shape of the flaps and the shape of the actuation um, mechanism. So key, uh, different examples. And again, you want to make sure there's a significant difference between the open and closed position so that you can actually let the light go through when it's open and occlude the light when it's closed. So finding a shape that has a, the, the significant difference between the open and closed position is critical for the design of this uh, uh, system. So then you need the validation. So once you succeed in finding the shape, putting everything together, you know, uh, predicting how it would perform, you need to make sure that the predictions were correct. So this is, a, you know, you see here actually the physical testing of the facade shading system to guarantee that it would have the same performance as predicted uh, by the mathematical model. So you can see an example, you know, showing uh, all the different flaps are, are actuated. And this is the results of the uh, the physical measurements. Uh, so we uh, place the facade shading system in a room um, and um, measure uh, the lighting levels to see if they match the predictions. As you can see uh, here, they were very close, extremely close, in fact. So thereby validating uh, the design uh, system. You can see we also were able to find out when it would be more efficient uh, you know, uh, to use the facade shading system. Not surprisingly, the system is more efficient if you use it uh, on facades that are facing um, south. So in short, what are the contributions of this work? So we have a digital workflow supported by uh, design tools uh, that enable a, a bottom-up process for design of the flaps and a top-down process to check, you know, the performance of the, of, of the system in terms of uh, lighting levels uh, of, of rooms, uh, for instance, you want to guarantee that you have the lighting level for an office space. So the, the lighting level should vary between 200 and 300 luxes. So uh, you, you need to design in a way to bring as much as possible of artificial lighting, lighting. So now we have a method to design uh, this facade system. So what you see in just one possibility for you know the shading system. You can have many different kinds of shapes and you are just scratching the surface at this point. Uh, you know you need to develop more research to increase uh, the design solutions and we have validated the model. So we have basically developed a tool to design uh, a responsive facade shading uh, uh, screens. And we will you know present uh, uh, um, a mock of this work at the Lisbon Architectural Triennial uh, next fall. And just the project is funded by the American Institute of Architects and by the Research Center at the Penn State, the Center for uh, Living Multifunctional Materials, and the Center for Design Computing. So this concludes my presentation, and if you like, you can have questions.